Star Wars Cross Current by Paul S. Kemp Read by David Dillon Chapter 1 The Past 5,000 Years Before the Battle of Yavin The crust of Phagon's sea, largest moon burned, buckled, and crumpled under the onslaught. Sixty-four specifically equipped cruisers, little more than a planetary bombardment, Weapon systems with a bit of starship wrapped around them. Flew in a suborbitable longitudinal formation. The sleek silver cruisers, their underbellies aglow and reflected destruction. Struck Sace is unexpectedly beautiful. How strange that they could unleash annihilation in such warm, glorious colors. Plasma beams shrieked from the bow of each cruiser and slammed into the arboreal surface of the moon, shimmering green umbilicals that wrote words of ruin across the surface and scattered the world in fire and pain. Dust in a swirl of thick black smoke churned in the atmosphere as the cruisers methodically vaporized large swaths of the moon's surface. The bright light and black smoke of destruction filled Harbinger's view screen, drowning out the orange light of the system's star Except for the occasional beep of a droid or a murmured word, the bridge crew, the bridge crew, the bridge crew sat in silence, their eyes fixed alternatively on the ins on their instruments in the view screen. Background chatter on the many comm channels droned over the various speakers, a serene counterpoint to the chaos on the moon's death. Sace's keen olfactory sense caught a whiff of his human crew's sweat, spiced with the tang of adrenaline. Watching the cruisers work, watching the moon die, Sace was reminded of the Dale fruits he'd enjoyed in his youth. He had spent many afternoons under the sun of his homeworld, peeling away the Dale fruits' coarse brown rind to get at the core of sweet, pale flesh. Now he was peeling not fruit, but an entire moon. The flesh under the rind of the moon's crust, the lignin they were mining, would ensure a Sith victory in the battle for Kirek and improve Sace's place in the Sith hierarchy. He would not challenge Shard de Khan immediately, of course. He was still too new to the Sith Order for that. But he would not wait over long. Evil roots and unbridled ambition, Rowan had told him once. Say smiled. What a fool his one-time master had been. Naga Seydal rewarded ambition. Status, he queried to science droid AK-6. The fires in the view screen danced on the anthropomorphic droid's reflective silver surface as it turned from its instrument console to address him. 37% of the moon's crust is destroyed. Wirelessly connected to the console's readout, the droid did not need to glance back for an update. On the information as the cruisers continued their work. 38%, 39%, Sace nodded, turning his attention back to the view screen. The droid fell silent. Despite the harbinger's distance from the surface, the force carried back to Sace the terror of the pre sentient primates populated the moon's surface. Sace imagined the small creatures fleeing through the trees, screeching, relentlessly pursued by, and inevitably consumed in fire. They numbered in the hundreds of thousands. Their fear caressed his mind, a faint, fleeting, and pleasing as morning fog. His fellow Sith on Harbinger and Omen would be feeling the same thing as the genocide progressed to its inexorable conclusion. Perhaps even the Masasi aboard each ship would, in their dim way, perceive the ripples in the Force. Long ago, when Sace had been a Jedi, before he had come to understand the dark side, such a wholesale destruction of life might have struck him as wrong. He knew better now. There was no absolute right and wrong. There was only power, and those who wielded it defined right and wrong for themselves. That realization was the freedom offered by Darkseid and the reason the Jedi would fall, first at Kirek, then at Coruscant, then all over the galaxy. Temperature in the wake, he asked. The science right consulted the sensor data and on its comp screen, within the tolerance of the harvester droids. Sace watched the cruiser slide through the atmosphere and light the moon on fire. 
and he turned in his command chair to face his second in command, Lost Door. Door's mottled deep red skin looked neatly looked nearly black in the dim light of the bridge. His yellow eyes mirrored the moon's fires. He never seemed to look up into Sace's eyes, instead focusing his gaze on the twin horns that jutted from the sides of Sace's jaw. Sace knew that Dor was much a spy for Nagasadao, as he was an ostensible aide to himself. Among other things, Dor was there to ensure that Sace returned from the Lignan, all of the Lignan, to Sadas forces of Primus Golud. The tentacles on Dor's face quivered, and the cartilaginous ridges over his eyes rose into question. Give the order to launch the harvesters, droids, Colonel, Say said to him. Harbingers and omens. Yes, Captain, Dor responded. He turned to his console and transmitted the orders to both ships. The honorific captain still struck Sace's hearing oddly. He was accustomed to leading hunting parties as a first, not ships as a captain. In moments, hundreds of cylindrical paws streaked out of Harbinger's launching bay, and hundreds more flew from her sister ship, Omen, all of them streaking across the view screen. They hit the atmosphere and spat lines of fire as they descended. The sight reminded Sace of a pyrotechnic display. Harvester droids away, 8K6 intoned. Stay with the droids and magnify, Sace said. Copy, answered Dor, and nodded as the young human helmsman who controlled the view screen. The harvester droids' trajectories placed them tens of kilometers behind the destruction wrought by the mining cruisers. Most of them were lost to sight in the smoke, but the helmsman kept the view screen's perspective on a dozen or so that descended through the clear spot in the sky. Attrition among the points among the droids upon entry is negligible, said AK-6. 0.03%. The helmsman further magnified the view screen in, again, then again. Five kilos above the surface, the droid arrested their Descent with thrusters, unfolded into their insectoid forms, and gently dropped to the charred, superheated surface. Anti-grav servos and platform pads on their six legs allowed them to walk on the smoking ruin without harm. Give me a view from one of the droids. Copy, sir, said Dor. The helm worked his console, and half the view screen changed to a perspective of the droid's eye view of the moon. A murmur ran through the bridge crew, an exhalation of awe. Even AK-6 looked up from the instrumentation. The voice of Captain Corson, commander of the Harbinger sister ship Omen, broke through the comm chatter and boomed over the bridge speakers. That is a sight. It is, Sace answered. Smoke rose in whiffs from the exposed subcrust. The heat of the plasma beams had turned the charred surface as hard and brittle as glass. Thick cracks and chasms lined the subcrust, veins through which only smoke and ash flowed. Waves of heat rose from the surface, distorting visibly and giving the moon an un another worldly dreamlike feel. Hundreds of harvester droids dotted the surface, metal flies clinging to the moon seared corpse. Walking in the awkward, insectoid manner, they arranged themselves into orderly rows. Their high pitched droids speak more mere chatter in the background. Sensors activating in tone 8K6. As one long metal proboscis is extended from each other of the droid's face. They ambled along in the wake of the destruction, waving their proboscises over the surface like dowsing rods, fishing the subsurface for the telltale molecular sign of lignin. Think of the lignin, Sace licked his lips, tasted a faint flavor of phosphorus. He had handled a small lignin crystal years before and still remembered the charge he had felt while holding it. His connection with the crystal had been the first. Sign of his affinity for the dark side. The unusual molecular structure of lignin attuned it to the dark side and enhanced the Sith's power when using the Force. The Sith had not been able to locate any significant deposits of the crystal in recent decades, until now, until just before the battle for Karek, and it was Sace who had done it. A few standard months ago, Naga Sadao had charged Sace with locating some deposits of the rare crystal for its for the use in the war. It was a test, Sace knew. In Lost Door, his insensible aide was grading him. The Force had given Sace his answer. 
that brought him eventually and at last possible moment before the conflict began to Phagon Three. The Force had used him as a tool to ensure Sith victory. The realization warned him. His scaled skin creaked as he adjusted his weight in the chair. He would harvest enough lignin from Phagon Three's moon to equip almost every Sith Lord and Masasi warrior preparing for the assault on Karek. If he'd had more time, he could have mined the moon in a more methodical, less destructive fashion. But he did not have time, and Sadow would not tolerate delay. So Sace had created his own right and wrong, and the primates and other life forms on Phagon Three's moon had died for it. He tapped his forefinger on his lightsaber hilt his curved form reminiscent of a claw, impatient to see the results of the droid sensor scans. He leaned forward in his chair when an excited beep announced the first discovery of a lignin signature. Another joined it, another. He shared a look with Dor, and could not tell from the fix of Dor's mouth, partially unmasked as it was by a beard of tentacles, if his colonel was pleased or displeased. There it is, Sace, said Corson from the omen. We've done it. In truth, Sace had done it. Corson had been simply following his lead. Yes. It appears to be a large deposit, said 8K6. More and more, the Harvester droids chirp news of their discovery over the comm channel. Perhaps more than we have time to acquire, said Dor. Shall I recall the mining cruisers, Captain? Further destruction seems unwarranted. Sace heard the question behind the question and shook his head. Dor would find no pity in Sace. No. Incinerate the entire surface. What we cannot take before the battle at Kirik, we will return for after our victory there. Dor nodded, and a faint smile disturbed the tentacles. Yes, sir. Sace fixed his colonel with his eyes, and Dor's gaze fell to Sace's jaw horns. And when you report back to Lord Sadow, you tell him all that you saw here. Dor looked up held Sace's eyes only for a moment before his tentacles twitched, and he turned away. Sace allowed himself a moment's satisfaction as drill probes extended from the droid's abdomens and began pulling the rare crystal from the burning corpse of the moon. The Force continued to carry the terror of the primates to Sace's consciousness, but with less impact. There were fewer left. He could not help but smile. Use the shuttles to collect the ore, he said to Dor. Almonds, too. We take as much as we can, quickly as we can. Copy. Several standard hours later, Fagon Three's smoking moon and all its inhabitants were dead. The mining cruisers, having finished their work, had jumped out of the system. A steady steam of transport shuttles traveled between moon and omen and harbinger's cargo holds, filling both the ships with unrefined lignin ore. The presence of so many crystals so near caused Sace to feel giddy almost inebriated. Dor and the other Force sensitives aboard Harbinger and Omen would be feeling much the same way. Extra discipline with the Masasi, Say said to Dor. Lignin would agitate them. He wanted to head off outbreaks of violence, or at least he wanted the violence appropriately directed. I will inform the security teams, Dor said. Do you feel that, Captain? Say nodded, drunk on the dark side. The air in the ship was alive with its potential. His skin felt warm, his head light. With an effort of will, he regained his focus. He had little time before he would rendezvous with Nega Sadao and the rest of the Sith force, moving against Kirek. He opened a comm channel with Omen. An hour more, Corson, he said. Agreed, Corson answered, and Sace felt the humans bleed through the connection. Do you feel the power on us, Sace? Kirik will burn. Say stared at the incinerated moon in his view screen, spinning dark and dead through the void of space. It will, he said, and cut off the connection. Rowan stared out of the large, transparent steel bubble window that fronted the cockpit of the starfighter. Beside him, his Padawan, Jev, tapped hyperspace formulae into the navigation computer. Jev's body challenged the seat with its girth. His flight suit pinched adipose tissue at neck and wrist, giving his head and hands the look of tied off sausages. Still, Jev was almost thin by the standard of Askegians, and Relin had never before met an Askegian in, in whom the force was so strong. Their infiltrator hung in the orange and red cloud of the Remnant Nebula. 
The small ship, with its minimal, deliberately erratic emission signature, sleek profile, and sensor bat files, would be invisible to the scans inside the swirl. Lines of yellow and orange light vein the superheated gas around them. A terrestrial lightning frozen in time. Drellin watched the clouds slowly turn in the magnetic winds. He had been across half the galaxy since joining the Jedi, and the beauty hid it, it hid in its darkness corners amazed him still. He saw in that beauty the force made manifest, a physical representation of the otherwise un invisible power that served as the scaffolding of the universe. But the scaffolding was under threat. Sadal and the Sith would corrupt it. Rowan had seen the consequence of that corruption firsthand when he had lost sight to the dark side. He pushed the memory from his mind, the pain still too acute. The conflict between Jedi and Sith had reached a turning point. Carrick would be a fulcrum, tilting the war toward one side or the other. Rowan knew the Jedi under Mehmet and Adil and Odan Ur had fortified the planet well, but he knew too that Sadao's fleets would come in overwhelming force. He suspected they would be they would also strike Coruscant, and had so notified Nadal. Still typing in coordinates, Jeb asked, We'll be able to pick up the beacon's pulse once we enter hyperspace. Yes, Rowan said. At least that was the theory. If they were right about the hyperspace lane Harbinger and Omen had taken, if Sace had not diverted his ship to another hyperspace lane, and if Harbinger Omen remained near enough the hyperspace lane, for the, beacon, for the beacon signal to reach them. And if the agents did not place the hyperspace beacon, or if Sace located and disabled it, Rowan stared out at the nebula. Peace, Trev. There are many ifs. Things are not what they are. Matters have moved so rapidly of late that Rowan had not time to report back to his superiors as regularly as he should. Just the occasional missive sent in subspace burst as time and conditions allowed. He had picked up Sace's trail near Primus Golud. There, he'd seen the armada of Sith forces marshalling for an assault. He'd seen Sace's ship leave the armada with a sinister, with a sister ship, Omen, falling in behind. After sending his short subspace report back to the Order on Coruscant and Kirak, Relin had received orders to follow Sace and try to determine the Sith's purpose. He had learned little as Harbinger and Omen moved rapidly from one back rocket system to another, dispatching recon droids, scanning, and moving on. He is searching for something, Rowan said, more to himself than Drev. Drev chuckled, and his double chin shook. Sace? His conscious, no doubt. He seems to have misplaced it somewhere. Rowan did not smile. The loss of Sace cut too sharply for Jess. I worry over your casual attitude toward matters of import. Many will die in this war. Dreb bowed his head, his shoulders drooping, trying to look contrite under the mass of thick brown hair. Forgive me, Master, but I... He paused through his round face, though his round face showed him struggling with a thought. What is it? Rowan asked. Dreb did not look at him as he said, I sometimes think you laugh too little. Among my people, the shamans of the Moon Lady teach that tragedy is the best time for mirth. Laugh, when you, even when you die, they say. There is joy to be found in almost everything. And there is also pain, Rowan said, thinking of Sace. Are the coordinates ready? Drev stiffened in his chair, in, in his tone. Ready, Master. Then let us find out what it is that Sace is looking for. Rowan maneuvered the infiltrator out of the nebulae and checked it against Jeff's coordinates. Stars dotted the view screen. We go, Rowan said. Jeff touched a button on his console, and the transparent steel cockpit window dimmed to spare them the hypnotic blue swirl of a hyperspace tunnel. Rowan engaged a hyperdrive. Points of light turned to infinite lines. The present, 41.5 years after the Battle of Yavin. Darkness plagued Jaden the lightless link of the singularity. He was falling, falling forever. His stomach crawled up his throat, crowding out whatever scream he might have uttered. He still felt the force around him, within him, but only thickly, only attenuated, as if his sensitivity were numbed.
he hit unseen ground with a grunt and fell to all fours. Snow crunched under his palms and boots. Gusts of freezing wind rifled his robes and stabbed stab at his skin. Icy borne by the wind peppered his face and rhymed his beard. He still could see nothing in the pitch. He stood, shaky, shaking, freezing. Where is this place, he called. The voice, the darkness was so deep he could not see his frozen breath. His voice sounded small in the void. R6? No response. R6? Odd, he thought, that the first thing he called for in an uncertain situation was his droid rather than a fellow Jedi. He reached for the familiar heft of his primary lightsaber, found his belt clip empty. He reached around to the small of his back for his secondary lightsaber, the true but effective weapon he had built as a boy in Coruscant, without any training in the Force, and found it gone too. His blaster was not in his thigh holster, no glow rod in his utility pocket. He was cold, alone, unequipped, blind in the darkness. What had happened? He remembered nothing, drawing his robes tightly around him to ward off the cold. He focused his hearing, but heard nothing over the wind except the gong of his heartbeat in his ears. With difficulty, he reached out with his, for with his force sense to the fog of his benighted sensitivity, trying to feel the world around him indirectly. Through the dull operation of his expanding consciousness, he sensed something. There were others there with him. Out in the darkness, several others. He sharpened his concentration in the tang of the dark side to ease his perception. Sith. But not quite Sith, not entirely. The dark side adulterated. He tried to ignore the familiar caress of the dark side's touch. He knew the line between light and dark was as narrow as a fiber blade edge. His master, Kyle Katarn, had taught him as much. Every Jedi walked that edge. Some understood the precipice under their feet, and some did not and it was the latter who so often fell. But it was the former who so often suffered. Jaden frequently wished he had remained as in ignorance, but stayed the boy on chorus and for whom the force had been magic. Summoned from the past, his master's words bounced air around his brain. The force is a tool, Jaden, sometimes a weapon, sometimes a solve. Dark side, light side. These are distinctions of insignificant difference. Do not fall into the trap of classification. Sentience cursed us with the desire to categorize and draw lines, to fear that after this be dragons, but that is illusion. After this is not dragons, but more knowledge, deeper understanding. Be at peace with that. But Jay never had been at peace with that. He feared he never would. Worse, he feared he never should. But after completing his training, Jaden had done some research into unorthodox theories about the Force. He had come to think and fear that his master had been right. Show yourselves, he called to the darkness, and the howling wind devoured his words. He knew the Sith would have sensed his presence, the same as he had sensed theirs. They were all around him, closing fast. He felt vulnerable, with nothing in his back, unable to see. He sank into the Force and denied his fear. Finding his calm, he stood in a half-crouch, eyes closed, mind focused, his entire body a coiled spring. Even without his lightsaber, a dark side user would find him a formidable foe. Jaden, whispered a voice in his ear, a voice he'd heard before he only on a vid screen surveillance. He spun, whirled, the power of the force gathered in his hands for a telekinetic glass, and saw only darkness. Lumia. It had been Lumia's voice, hadn't it? Lumia was long dead. A hand clutched his robe. Jaden, said another voice, Lassen's voice. He used the force to arg augment a backward leap, flipping in midair and landed on his feet three meters behind Lassen, a fellow Jedi Knight who should have been dead, who had died soon after the Ragnos crisis. Lassen's voice unmoored him from his calm, and the force lightning, blue and baleful, came unbidden and crackled on his fingertips. He saw nothing. The hairs on Jaden's neck rose. He stared at his hand the blue discharge of his fingertips. With an effort of will, he quelled it. Jaden Kor, said a voice to his left, Master Cam Solo Sir's voice, but Jaden felt not the comforting presence of another light use side user, only the ominous energy of the dark side. He spun, but saw only darkness. 
What you seek can be found in the black hole on Faust, Jaden, said Mary Jade Skywalker. And still Jaden saw nothing. No one. Mary Jade Skywalker was dead. Who are you? He called out, and the wind answered with ice and screams. Where am I? He reached out again in his four cents, with his four cents, trying to locate Lumia, Lassen, Solasar, and Skywalker, but found them gone. Again, he was alone in the darkness. He was always alone in the darkness. It registered with him then. He was dreaming. The Force was speaking to him. He should have realized it sooner. The revelation sealed the world. The wind fell silent and the air cleared of ice. Jaden stood ready, tense. A distant, sourceless cry sounded repeated itself. The rhythm regular, the tone mechanical. It could have been coming from the other side of the planet. Help us! Help us! Help us! Help us! He turned a circle, fist clenched. Where are you? The darkness around him diminished. Pinpoints of light formed in the black vault over him. Stars. He scanned the sky, searching for something familiar. There. He recognized only enough to place the sky somewhere in rimward, in the rimward sector of the unknown regions. The dim blue glow of a distant gas giant burned in the black of the sky, its light peeking diffidently through the swirl. Thin rings composed of particles of ice and rock belted the gas giant. He was on one of the gas giant's moons. His eyes adjusted more fully to the dimness, and he saw that he stood on a desolate, wind-wracked plain of ice that extended as far as he could see. Snowdrifts as tall as buildings gave the terrain the appearance of a storm-wracked ocean frozen in time. Cracks faintly the exposed ice in the circulatory system of a stalled world. Chasms dotted the surface here and there like hungry mouths. Glaciers groaned in the distance, the rumbles of an angry world. He saw no sign of Lumia or Lassen or any of, of the other Sith impostors he had sensed. He saw no life sign anywhere. His breath formed clouds before his face. His left fist clenched and unclenched reflexively over the void in his palm, where his lightsaber should have been. Without warning, the sky exploded above him with a thunderous boom. A cloud of fire tore through the atmosphere, smearing the side, smearing the sky in smoke and flame. A shriek like stress metal rolled over Jaden, ice cracked and groaned on the surface. Jane squinted up at the sky, still lit with the afterglow of the destruction, and watched a rain of glowing particulates fall, showering the moon in a hypnotic pattern of falling sparks. His first sense perceived them for what they were. The dark side reified. He disengaged his perception too slowly, and the impact of so much evil hit him like a punch in the face. He vomited down the front of his robes, fell to the frozen ground, and balled up on the sides of the frozen surface of the moon as the full weight of the dark side coated him in its essence. There was nowhere to hide, no shelter. It fell all around him, on him, saturated him. He woke, sweating and lightheaded, to the sound of speeder and swoop traffic outside his course and apartment. The, the thump of his heartbeat rattled the bars of his ribcage. In his mind's eye, he still saw the shower of falling sparks, the rain of evil. He cleared his throat, and the sensors in the room, detecting his wakefulness, turned on dim room lights. R6, he said. No response. He sat up alarm. R6. The sound of shouts and screams outside the window caused him to leap from his bed. With a minor exercise of will, he pulled his primary lightsaber out to his hand from the side table near his bed and activated it. The green blade pierced the dimness of the room. The black ball of Corbin filled Kel's white view screen. Clouds sent see this atmosphere. An angry turn. He settled Predator, a cloaked shaped fighter modified with a hyperspace sled and sensor evading technology copied from a stolen Stealth X into low orbit. The roiling cloak and dark energy that shrouded the planet buffeted Predator, and the ship's metal creaked in the strain. Kel tuned his vision to fate and saw the hundreds of Dane Nosi fate lines of course and a Coruscantite academic who once translated the Anzadi term that intersected a Corbin, the planet like a bulbous black spider in a web of glowing potentialites. The past, present, and future lines of the galaxy's fate pass through the Sith of Tomb Worlds, inhabiting shreds of glowing green, orange, red, and blue that cut into pieces. Space time was pregnant with the possible, 
and the richness of, richness of the soup swelled Kel's hunger. He had first seen the day nosy in childhood, after his first kill, and had followed him since. He thought himself unique among the Anzati, special, called, but he could not be certain. Thinking of his first kill, he turned turned his mind to the food he kept in the cargo hold of the Predator, but he quelled his body's impulse with a thought. His own day nosy he stretched out before him. The veins of his own faded network of silver lines reaching down through the transparency of the cockpit and into the dark swirl, down to the tombs of the Sith, to the secret place where the one Sith lurked. He had business with them, and they with him. The lines of their fates were intertwined. He punched the coded coordinates of his destination into the Navicom and engaged the autopilot. As Predator began its descent through the black atmosphere, he left the cockpit and went down below decks. the cargo hold. He had half a standard hour before he would reach his destination, so he freed his body to feel hunger. Growing anticipation sharpened his appetite. Five stasis freezers stood against one wall in the hold like coffins. Kel had given them their own clear space in the hold, separated from the equipment and vehicles that otherwise cluttered the compartment. A humanoid slept in stasis in each freezer, three humans and two Rodians. He examined the freezer's readouts, checking the vital signs, all remained in good health. Staring at their still features, Kel wondered what happened behind their closed eyes in the quiet of the, their dreams. He imagined the zest of their soup, and hunger squirmed in his gut. No, were, None were so-called Force-sensitives, who had been the richest soup, but they would suffice. He glided from one freezer to the next brushing his fingertips on the cool glass that separated him from his prey. His captive's day no sigh extended from the freezers to him, his to them. He stopped before the middle-aged human male he had taken on Corellia. You, he said, and watched the silver lines intertwine with the green lines of the Corellian. He activated the freezer's thaw cycle. The hiss of escaping gas screamed the human's end. Kel watched as the freezer's radar indicated a rising temperature. Watch his color return to the human's flesh. His hunger grew, and his feeders nesting in the sacks of his teeth twitched. He needed his prey conscious, otherwise he could not transcend. He reached to the Dane Nosai that connected him to his meal. Awaken, he softly projected. The human's eyes snapped open, pupils dilated, lids wide. Fear traveled through the mental connection, and Kale savored it. The freezer's readout showed a spiking heart rate, increasing respiration. The human opened his mouth to speak, but his motor function, still sluggish from stasis, could produce only a muffled, groggy croak. Kale pressed the but release button, and the freezer's cover slid open. Be calm, he projected, and his command wormed its way into the human's mind, a prophylactic for the fear. But his growing terror overpowered Kale's casual physical hold. Psychic hold. The human struggled against the, his mental bonds. Finally found his voice. Please, I have done nothing. Kel leaned forward, took the human's jotty face, doughy face, in his hands. The human shook his head, but was no match for Kel's strength. Please, the Corellian said. Why are you doing this? Who are you? What are you? Kel watched all the humans day no see. All of his potential features coalesce into a single green line. They intersected Kel's silver and where it stopped. I am a ghost, Kale answered, and opened the slits in his, feast, in his face. His feeders squirmed free of their sacks, wire-thin appendages that fed in the soup of the sentient. The human screamed, struggled, but Kale held him fast. Be calm, Kale predicted again, and this time with force, and the human fell silent. The feeders wormed their way into the warm, moist tunnels of the Corellian nostrils and rooted upward, anticipating Anticipation caused Kale to droll. He stared into the human's wide, bloodshot eyes as the feeders penetrated tissue, pierced membranes, and entered the skull cavity and sank into the rich gray stew that in the human's skull. A spasm racked the human's body. Tears pulled in his wide eyes and fell, glistening down his cheeks. Blood dripped in thin lines from his nose. Kale grunted with satisfaction as he devoured potential futures. As the human signs ended, and Kale's continued. Kale's eyes rolled back into his head. 
and his dating notes at LinkedIn, and he temporarily became one with his super fate. His consciousness deepened, expanded to the size of the galaxy, and he mentally sampled its potential. Time compressed. The arrangement of day notes across the universe looked less chaotic. He saw a hint of order. Revelation seemed just at the edge of his understanding, and he experienced a tingling shudder with each beat of his heart. Show me, he thought. Let me see. The moment passed as the human expired, and Kel let him drop to the floor of the bay. Revelation retreated as he backed, and he backed away from the corpse, gasping. He came back to himself, mere flesh, mere limited comprehension. He looked down at the cooling body at his feet, understanding that only in murder did he transcend. He retracted his feeders, slick with blood, mucus, and brains, and they sat quiescent in their sacks. Sighing, he collected the human's corpse, bore it to the airlock, and set the controls to eject it. Through the centuries, he had left such a litter on hundreds of planets. As he watched the automated ejection sequence vacate the airlock, he consoled himself with the knowledge that one day he would feed on the stronger suit that would reveal him to, the, reveal to him the whole truth of fate. Reasonably sated, he returned to the cockpit of Predator and linked his comm receiver to the Navicomp, as he had been instructed. In moments, the autopilot indicator winked on, winked out, Reminding Kel of the way the Corellian's eyes had winked out, how the human had transformed from sentience to meat in the span of a moment, and another force took control of the Predator. Kel settled into his chair as the ship sped through the melee of Corbin's atmosphere toward the dark side of the planet. A short time later, Predator set down in the midst of ancient structures. Lightning illuminated weather pyramids towers of pitted stone, crystalline domes, all from the temples and tombs of the Sith, all from the geometry of the dark side. Black clouds roiled, and jagged runs of lightning formed a glowing net in the sky. Kel rose, slid into his mimetic suit, checked his twin cortosis-coated vibroblades, sheathed his belt. And headed for Predator's landing ramp. Before lowering it, he took a blaster and holster from a small arms locker and strapped them to his thigh. He considered blasters <coughs> inelegant weapons, but preferred to be overarmed rather than under. He pressed a release button on the ramp. Hydraulics hummed and the door lowered. When it rang, hissed from the Predator into the Predator. Corbin's air punched him with the reek of past ages. Filled his nostrils. Thunder boomed. Kale stared out into the darkness, noted a clustered pinpoints of red light that floated into the pitch. He shifted on his feet as if lights drew closer. As lights drew closer. Silver protocol droid. He tuned his vision to fate, but saw no gain no sight. Droids were programming, nothing more. They made no real choices, so had no line and so had no lines. The false sentience of droid unearthed Kale as he cut off the perception. The anthropomorphic droid strode through the wind and rain to the base of the landing ramp and bowed his head, its head, and the hum of servos. Master Anzeth, the droid said in basic, I am D45. Please follow me. The master awaits you. The droid's words rooted Kale to the deck. Despite himself, Kale's twin hearts doubled their beating rate. Adrenaline flowed into his blood. The features and cheeks spasmed. He inhaled, focused for a moment, and returned his body to calmness. His hormone level up to normal. <coughs> the master Craig himself. Please follow, the droid said, turned and began walking. Kel pulled up the hood of his suit, but did not lower the mask. He strode down the ramp and stepped out into the storm. Corbin drenched him. With a minor effort of will, he adjusted his core body temperature to compensate for the chill. The droid led him along dead avenues lined with the ancient stone and steel monuments of the Sith Order. Kel saw no duracrete, no transparistone, nothing modern. On much of Corbin, he knew new layers had been built on the old over the millennia, 
creating a kind of archaeological stratification of the Sith Ages. No, not here. The most ancient of Sith tombs and temples set undisturbed. Here, Crate wandered in his dreams of conquest. A flash of lightning fade in the sky, painting shadows across the necropolis. Kills from medics who adjusted to account for the temporary change in lighting. As he walked, he felt a growing regard fixed on him, consciousness. Ahead, he saw a squat tower of aged stone, great sanctuary. Spirals of dark energy swirled in languid arcs around the spire. Only a few windows marred its otherwise featureless exterior. Black holes that opened into a dark interior. To Cal, they looked like screaming mouths, protesting the events transpiring within. The droid ascended a wide, tiered stairway that led a pair of iron doors at the base of the spire. Age corroded writing and scroll work spiraled over the door surface. Kel could not read it. Remain here, please, the droid said, and vanished behind the doors. Kel waited under Corbin's angry sky, surrounded by the tombs of Corbin's dead Sith Lords. Checking his wrist chrono from time to time, he attuned his senses to his surroundings and waited on Crate's pleasure. Footsteps sounded from behind him, barely audible above the rain. He changed his perception as he turned and saw a thick network of Dane Nosy that extended through the present to the future, wrapping the galaxy like a great serpent that would strangle it.